Good morning, everyone. I hope you all can hear me. So we, we had a great start. I just want uh, to jump into the talk because I think we spent a few minutes already doing nothing, almost. So let's talk about a new thing that I'm trying to introduce to the audience here. We have come a long way. We're going to uh, go through the journey that I had and you had along with me for lab animal science in India. So if you look at the title, we'll come back to this title, try to memorize the title. It has two segments. One is Capability Maturity Model. I'm sure there are some MBAs in this group who understands what it means. And then Culture of Care, which we all understand. So let's uh, get a brief introduction of where this started. So we had a great Mumbai conference, Lhasa, and then followed by a Bangalore conference last year. Uh, a major success story, which uh, me and our group led in Bangalore. And now we pass the baton to Vijay and uh, Shika and Rana, and they are doing a fantastic job. So this is an advancement that is very visible, obvious for all of us to realize that we are having regular meetings every year. That's the first step for us to succeed. My own journey started uh, here in India, but then when I went back uh, and led a program for comparative medicine in the National Institute of Health for Aging, uh, for eight years as uh, chief of the program, and then moved on to University of Maryland as a faculty member, so they both crisscrossed. Then I came back to BBRC, which is uh, Biocon Bristol Myers Squibb Research Center, a collaborative effort by Bristol Myers Squibb, which obviously is a very well known drug company that's right now the pioneer of producing cancer therapeutics, biologicals that can treat lung cancer, melanoma carcinomas, breast cancer lymphomas and lymphosarcomas and so many other things. So we are proud to say that we have journeyed through that part. And then the good news is, uh, or, or how you take it, is for me to go the full circle and then come back to India to address this audience today and probably to have a longer tenure in India starting next year. So that is our introduction. And uh, I'm very happy that we are not in that honeymoon phase where we try to enjoy without doing anything. But then here we are doing a lot of work. So this is, this is actually very important for us to recognize how we started this. Lab animal science from 2008. I'm not going to the past history of data and how the uh, welfare regulations, everything came on board. We are going to restrict ourselves to quality animal science, good research, and with uh, your consents agreeing with uh, being very nice to animals as we produce good results. So in 2008, the, the year when I arrived, and then when Vijay and uh, many people were probably thinking about what is a lab animal, how do we deal with it, they were using it. And they are now educated, being educated so nicely because of the efforts of uh, Ramachandra and Arvind Lhasa in general, and many more people, right? So now there are more volunteers, the more uh, signatories to this Lhasa program. So we created a Sentinel program and health monitoring program in our own institute, and then dissipated that to the rest of India. And that is where the awareness of health, clean animal came about. And suddenly people talked about how to find an infection. So we did not have diagnostics in-house in India. And then quite a few people, including some vendors and some institutes like Indian Institute of Science, jumped up and grabbed that opportunity to get into diagnostics. And few names that stand out in this are Taconic, VivoBio, and Invigo. Jackson, and some other companies, at and and many more. So I don't want to specify which one is the better one, but definitely they all contributed to a clean animal supply. The next problem we landed is importing animals all the time at a very high cost. And we tried to solve that by breeding the rodents within the facilities, which India was doing already, but not knowing what the quality is, and then extending that program to a vendor development program where the vendors actually got into this aspect of breeding clean animals and supply. So this is now catching up quite a bit of speed in India, and we have that. And don't forget the contributions of facilities, instrumentation, equipment. We heard uh, Franco give a talk yesterday about cage cleaning, sanitization, Techniplast. So we know the contributions of the other side of the industry, which has to deal with technology. So if we combine clean animal, diagnostics, breeding of the animal, and equipment that follows this. All of this put together between 2008 to 2015, I think we have reached that glorious point where we have very clean animal within India, available, tested, 
negative for all pathogens, and we are all being catered. So now we have the food on the plate, and all we need to do is put some nice curry and taste it, enjoy it, and then come up with good energy, right? So that's what we are going to talk about. But during this process, the government of India, CPCSE and others, of course, but then from the scientific perspective, DBT, the Department of Biotechnology, they also invested their time into improving the quality of the facilities. And glad to say that Ramchandra and I were part of that committee for some time, and we kind of know how these beautiful facilities in Hyderabad, Faridabad, Pune, and all these places came up with the funding from the government. So we have enormous support from the government, from the people, from the well-educated people, and well-trained people. Don't want to miss out on the scientific talent that we have, who actually demanded a clean animal. So all the scientists sitting here, you all should be very proud of the fact that you wanted a clean animal, and we were able to provide it within this timeline. So now we have to harmonize the practices that happens. And this is where ALAC, ICLAS, ELASA, everybody come into play. And we are trying to just make ourselves very equal to what happens in the rest of the world. And then all this will not happen if we don't train our people. So harmonization and training is an ongoing process. And it has been happening for decades. But we continue to do it. So that's where the date 2017 is. Because that's where we are going to put our effort. And when I say training, this conference is an indication of uh, that, that we are having right now. Right? So that's important for us to recognize. So that's a brief history for all of you who are probably very young and youngsters joining LASA. I think I wanted to give this slide. And also Vijay said that uh, we have enough time for me. So I plugged in 10 more slides for you all to, uh, like it or not, enjoy the show. <laughs> so if you, are, if you want to blame, blame Vijay for asking me to speak for 20 more minutes. Next important question in the last uh, 10 years, what happened? Do you perform health monitoring at your facility, including both non-rodents and rodents? This is a question that I asked along with my colleague, KB and Shakti. And we went ahead and asked this question to all the facilities in India, almost all that we can reach, and who are willing to tell us. And you can see that 87% of the people that we surveyed said that they have health monitoring. We will not get into the definition of how they interpreted what is self-monitoring, because each one has a different definition. They have a central program or not. They are looking at an animal, telling if you're sick or not. You need to be an expert, and they do that. So one way or the other, they were able to understand that they have a program to monitor the health, if they were using the diagnostic test kits or not. So that's good news. So India is aware of what is self-monitoring. And we extended this a little bit more, and we have beautiful publications in the Lab Animal Journal, both me and Sekhti. So list of organisms screened, viral, bacterial, parasite, rat, and mice, we produce this result for entire India. Now based on those results, we know what is the most prevalent. Starts with mycoplasma, goes all the way, right? So we went ahead and realized we don't have to test for all pathogens. We have to be very smart and test for pathogens that are very relevant for India so that we have a quality animal. So we identify the top 10, top 20 pathogens depending on the site of research and area of work you want. So that is a very important progress. Then we focused our attention on, um, after this pioneering work, into understanding other advances that came about, like ATP monitoring, not going to the flaws and advantages of that. But we embraced that technology. So we went into PCR, ATP monitoring. We went into ELISA, serology. We, we kind of looked into everything. What is the reason for that? We wanted a clean animal, right? So that clean animal is the most important part of our research and our lives. It's a, it's a science, science behind creating a clean animal. So we talked a little bit more about science. Now look at how uh, the growth has spurted in, in India in the last uh, five years, I would say, not, not last eight years. There's rodent breeding programs within India leading to clean rodent supply since 2009. And I have to thank the vendors like Balaji Zia Halasco and Sankar Miobayo uh, and Beagle. All of you have really played a part in producing a clean animal for the scientific community. And that's why research now is more credible. That's the most important part. So we can, uh, yesterday I talked about uh, arrive guidelines. I think it's very important for us to have that kind of clean animal, a quality animal. So that's an active breeding program going on. And you also see that there is latest and sophisticated equipment uh, being provided by various vendors. And now, DBT and the government have invested in enhancing those facilities, so there is also government interaction there. And the last thing is, of course, again, feeding back the same thing, 
diagnostics, which is the bread and butter of our research. If an animal is positive for a pathogen and you use that animal, it's very hard to publish the data, which means all your years of work is kind of not credible, not relevant. So that's important. And building clean facilities is another core strength that we have as LASA. And anybody on LASA would be aware of what a clean facility should look like, must look like, and we can provide guidance on that as well. Now, coming to all these takes, I'm slowly segueing into my main topic, which is about managing this whole show. Uh, producing a clean animal, breeding them, supplying them, having a clean facility. How do we arrive at that without knowing everything, right? So our basic understanding is those first set seven slides. This next slide is asking about who makes the decisions, right? The management. So we can be scientists, we can be caretakers, husbandry, veterinarians. But the management, which we are probably not part of all the time, unless you are probably growing up the ladder and reach that, which it is very important. Once you reach that, you can dictate what happens to science. And that's a very important uh, role for us as you grow. So many of the youngsters here, probably 10 years, 15 years down the road, you are going to be managers or even sooner. I hope you are going to be sooner than later. Because young dynamic leadership is very important for this country and for our program, and this is very important. So looking at where we inherit our leadership, Mahatma Gandhi, and then going from there, we should understand the complexity of the situation around us. We have to manage people, animal, supply, transportation, logistics, import, customs, diagnostics, science, and then also be answerable to your leadership and management to get more funding to continue to do what you are doing, right? So this is very important. So leadership should understand the complexity of situation. They must plan well for budget and organize and have the right, right kind of staff members who are well trained. The next thing that is important is you should be willing to lead the change and create a vision and communicate the new direction. And there are several entrepreneurs, as I see some of you sitting here, my older friends from my previous organization. I see Deepak already, but I'm probably missing several people here. But I see the entrepreneurs who have the vision to change the face of Indian lab animal science and the CRO business and the discovery R&D. And this is very important. So such kind of youngsters should understand the complexity, plan well, budget well, organize, have the right people, and lead the change, creating a vision and communicating the new direction so that we grow continuously. It's not a solid straight line. It's a very slanted raising line. It's kind of a line that should be very drastically envisioning what our government and our leadership wants us to do. And that was well captured by this morning's panel here and the dignitaries here and Vijay especially. So, so we are there. So let me introduce you to today's topic, which is not about Sentinel Health Monitoring Diagnostics or anything like that, which is pure science and which I love to talk and which I did for the last 25 years. But this is an area where I am putting my next half an hour and several years of my experience to let pass the buck on to the management people sitting here so that they can take some lessons from here and create the next visionary thought process that we all should embrace after this talk. And I will be willing to share whatever you want to make India really great in enhancing the leadership of a lab animal program. So, what is this about? The main topic today is to set the tone for defining who and what we do after this talk. We know what we are right now. We are probably scientists, we are probably directors, managers, supervisors, caretakers, husbandry, veterinarians, research fellows, associates. But after this talk, we want to define what we are going to be apart from that. So you are going to be all that plus more. So how do we get into that? So let me uh, probably cut the suspense down and give you some definitions of what we are talking about. Culture of care, it's not a new word. It's something that you are all familiar. We know what is care and what is culture. It happens in hospitals all the time without knowledge, without acknowledging. Nurses provide a great culture of care and they are our role models to be frank. Let's extend that to lab animal science and say that we want to create a culture of care in several lab animal facilities. So this is beyond, we want a clean animal. That is the first care. Provide the right bedding, housing, everything. And this is all part of the culture of care program. This is also not new to lab animal science because in 1995, I'm sure Kathleen is going to be here tomorrow from ALAC, 
uh, Catherine would allow to see this picture today, but I'm, I'm sure you all know Catherine. She pioneered along with Hilton Klein in writing an article, let's say, in an I Love Journal, establishing a culture of care, the first time ever it was used in lab animal science, on science and responsibility, addressing the improvement of scientific discovery, animal welfare through science-based performance standards. We're not talking about regulatory standards. We are looking at judging the animal, how they are behaving, how they are performing. Basing on that, we are making judgments on how much we are caring for the animal. That's where the enrichment and those things come into play. So the institutional culture of care is a key thing that promotes all this. Every institute must have, uh, strongly recommend, to have a culture of care committee or a subcommittee that probably dictates how you are going to care for the animals. Once you have that culture, it's a no-brainer. It's like easy for us to have everything else, clean animal, enrichment, everything. So if you look at uh, this slide here, culture is important to welfare, yet difficult to measure and track. And this is where the MBA comes into play. I don't have an MBA, but I learned quite a bit from MBA friends and talking to colleagues and understanding that, okay, there is a model that they call as something in MBA and we want to extrapolate that into this. So that is what I'm connecting now, capability maturity model with the culture of care. So we have to put systems in place, create that culture, and ultimately the welfare of the animal is the primary, is the centerpiece of this thing, and that leads to good animal, good for animals, good for science, and good for society. And that's where the three R's come into play. Let's look at the three R's that have made the animal lives better. Some examples, some key examples. I'm not going to give all the examples, but a few examples here. Uh, for instance, in our facility, we created a waste anesthetic gas scavenging system, a prototype, where we created a mechanism for absorbing the isofluorine gas that is generated so that it is not harmful to the humans who work. So culture of care is not just about animals, it's also about the people who work with animals. If the person here is inhaling isofluorine and thinking that he is aware of what's happening, that's wrong, right? So we have to know that he is fully conscious. An animal is protected, we're not wasting the gases. The next thing is close view of surgery platform inside a biosafety cabinet. So this is again to protect the people and the animal and a clean environment. Pain and distress, reducing that with multiple sampling instead of multiple injections. Uh, euthanasia, creating a new chamber where it looks very humane, uh, very even, and a very programmed. And the guide actually tells you to do that, right? So we follow those principles. And then we look into other things like training of staff and investigators, which is very important. Certifications are very important because then people know what they're doing and they're qualified to handle the animal. And then reporting the animal welfare concerns whenever they are raised. And then post approval monitoring. We're not going to the details, but you all know what we are trying to do. One such example, key example, is one latest example for a creative harmonization method to address refined TRs. One of the latest mechanisms is you don't have to euthanize the animal every single time to know what's happening inside the animal. You can use biomarkers, right? So biomarker is the latest trend. It's also very relevant. We have used biomarkers for ages. We look at sugar levels and say we are diabetic or non-diabetic, right? We look at blood pressure and you don't have to open the animal to find what's wrong with the animal. And this is where biomarkers can help. And this is probably some, an area where the future CROs, pharmaceutical companies have to look into looking, making life easy for the people to know what's happening in the animal, stopping the experiment when they see the biomarker, rather than telling we have to wait until the animal is euthanized. Even the, the FDA now is accepting biomarker data because that really prevents the animals from being getting euthanized. So this is very important from that perspective. Other important features of biomarkers and scientific discussions, I'm not going to go into it, but you are all aware of what we are talking. So there are cancer biomarkers, the genes that are expressed in some cancers, so you can always use those same genes in mice to see if the cancer is developing or not instead of looking at an animal, the size of the tumor, which is very enormously burdensome for the animal, you can look at a biomarker that creates uh, a result, right, for you to tell this is an endpoint. You don't want the animal to suffer. And some of the latest uh, techniques from some of the uh, CROs and uh, vendors and com companies uh, sampling the blood by volumetric absorptive microsampling. And that's like a weak method, you correct amount, fixed amount of sampling. That's also reducing the animal. You don't have to go into the tail vein every single time. But also for PCR, we have employed this. Uh, Jayesh is here, so he has done lots of them. And we collect buckle swab for PCR diagnostics instead of sleeping the tail, which is also something. So you, we are probably using all that, but these are innovative things that are available for us today to enhance and improve what we are doing. 
Then coming to Dr. Pant is probably going to talk a lot about stem cells. I'm not going to spend too much time. Uh, in fact, I'm quite ignorant of what happens beyond the certain phase here. I'm totally confused when it comes to CRISPR and all, right? So probably there are experts in this audience who know that. But what I can tell you is stem cells and organoid cultures and making organs into small balls and testing your compounds and everything is very important for reducing the number of animals. These are alternatives. So that's very important. So why, why and uh, how, I think uh, we'll have more discussions later. But definitely we're talking about the three R's, reducing animals, so we create stem cells. And one such example is the uh, iPSCs, stem cells, cardiomyocytes, and seeing a heartbeat and looking at the signals and everything and deriving the stem cells from the cardiac. So we, can, we have several ways to do that, even for neurons and everything. So th this is very important. So now coming at what we can do as management without getting into the animal itself, is post-approval monitoring. We can monitor protocols, staff, anesthesia procedure, surgery, care, euthanasia, and the records. We can do that and then make sure that there is a good culture of care. And PAM reporting when the person actually, the veterinarian stands next to the experimental uh, experiment and then observes what's happening and wants to see if he can improve the process right there. And that's very important, very relevant. And there's a lot of learning happening. And then obviously the IAEC committee plays a very big role in enhancing this culture of care. So the IAEC can sit and talk about all these things and improve the care. So culture of care is nothing about what you do today, what you do every day. You're probably unconsciously doing it, but you never measured it. So let us see if we can measure the culture of care, which is like, how much do you love me? If you ask a little child, then he'll say, I love you this much, right? Depends on how far the hands go. And he says, I love you this much, and I love my mother this much, then you're disappointed. The father, other way. You're disappointed. So why is that? So there is a measure. How far the hands move. That's a measure. It's not objective, but you know. You know that there is a level of measurement that you actually employ to measure love. And here we are talking about the measure, the culture of care. And how I want to uh, marry this capability maturity model, which is a discovery at uh, Carnegie Mellon. Uh, university, and then they use these five terms. We not use these terms. I kind of refine these terms for animal science. Unaware, first stage, second stage is being aware, third stage is to act proactively, and fourth stage is to systemically employ what you realize, and fifth stage is unconsciously you're doing it by nature. So this is how they measured a capability maturity model for various industries. But into the animal science, I refined it, and how to customize this for our organizations, institutes, or companies. Let's look at that. Culture of care maturity model has been developed to assist organizations in establishing a culture level. So you're not talking about what is your culture. What is the level? Identify the actions, and organizations should progress sequentially. So these five steps, you should be able to measure these five steps. I'll give you some cues on how you can measure these five steps. Uh, we work quite a bit in our organization on measuring this with surveys and all those things. We'll go into uh, more details. So this is a terminology that I would like to employ for our animal care facilities. Emerging, managing, involving, cooperating, and continually improving. So let's define the first one. Emerging is to develop the management team. Second one is to realize the importance of the staff. Third one is to engage all the staff and commit to improve animal welfare. Fourth one is to consistently do that. And fifth one is to become industry leaders in what you do. So let's go a little bit more refined manner into each one. Now we get into the details of how do you measure level one. So, so in level one, you realize that that's the lowest possible level. I think we are all probably definitely at level one, if not better. If you are at level one, you realize, and now you will start thinking about that. The only way you can make this talk interesting is in your mind, if I say something here, think about what's that in your organization right now. Think about that. And now you know, actually, you can measure what level you are in. At the end of the talk, you'll know, I'm at level one. I, I need a lot of work before I go to level two. So something like that. So let's look at lack of management commitment. Your management is not committed. You're on your own. You ask for something, the management says, I don't care about that, you do. That's level one. So your institute is in level one because the management is not committed. So animal welfare is viewed only as a legal requirement. Only because you are going to be punished, you want to care about animals. Not beyond that. That's, that's bad. Third one, the staff are not interested in animal welfare. They are just common doing routinely, just like changing shelves and cleaning books. 
and no defined process or procedure in place for meeting the complaints. Animal welfare is not seen as a business risk. Veterinary science department is perceived as the only one responsible for this. So the only the veterinarian is responsible for animals. He knows the animal, and nobody should be. That is level one. That's really bad. But then there is also, along with this, the symptoms are very clear, but then the result is high incidence of animal welfare <coughs> by nature, right? So you, you see a lot of these things. And how to achieve the next level. If you are thinking about your institute right now, and in your mind you think you have all these problems, and you have seen some incidents, then you know that you need to go educate and enhance the commitment. So now you need to talk to your leadership, and you need to educate your staff. So the two things, solutions for how to move from level one to level two. Now think that you are lucky and you got 95% of it correct in level one and you are in level two. And how do you look now? Let's see. Animal welfare is solely defined in terms of adherence to rules and procedures. You have something in place, rules and procedures. That's good. Animal welfare is seen as a business risk. Now you think, okay, if this animal gets sick, the result is not going to have accepted and the CRO is not going to be paid. So it's a business risk. So that is there. Incidences are seen as preventable. Now the management and people know that okay, we could have prevented this incident. So they know what the incidence is going to be before it happens. So that is level two. Most of us are there. <coughs> Almost all of us should be here. The organization's animal welfare incidence rate is very average. It's not like 10 per month. It's probably two to three per month. Incidents can be defined in various ways, right? So look at that. And then the company or the industry with level two the symptom is they have a react to approach. When they see an incident, they react. <coughs> Level one, they don't even know how many incidents they are having. Here they react, so this is an improvement. And how to reach, uh, reach level three? Provide technical training, behavior trainings, realize the importance of staff, proactive approach, make this reactive to proactive, adapt best practices, motivate your staff, reward them, and change the perspective. Animal welfare is good for science and people. So your institute should be saying this repeatedly and not saying that it's veterinary science responsibility. It's animal welfare, it's responsibility for all of us, and it's important for science and people. So you should be at level two. And going beyond that, level three, which has a lot more, is level three is probably where many institutes in USA are, and other countries. I would say we are in level two or level three. To be at level three, this is how a typical US institute would look like. And animal welfare instance rates are relatively low. A system is in place for animal welfare. I think many of us also have it. So if you look at it, oh, I, I seem to be having this, you're good. But you may be missing one or two key things here. Animals are treated with respect. I think that's a very important definition. Uh, managers recognize a wide, a wide range of factors causing incidences. So the managers are very much involved in finding and understanding it. Uh, a significant proportion of frontline employees are willing to work with the management. So you have committees, you have frontline staff who are willing to step up and do more for animal welfare. And the last thing is program is aligned with accreditations, CPCSEA, ALAC, and several, and animal welfare performance is actually monitored and data. You are collecting data on how the animals are performing. So this is very important. And not many people, unless you really love the animal and the science, you are not in this where you talk about respecting the animal, treating the animal data to monitor how the animals are doing and so on. So if you are at level three, you are with many, many very good institutes all over the world. So think about level one, level two, level three. Don't be disappointed if you are at level one, because it's very, very easy to come from level one to level two. All you need to do is two things, right? Educate and create awareness. That's all you need to do. You need to talk to your manager, you need to talk to your leader, ask them to come for meetings several times, educate your staff, provide them training. That's all you need to do. Level two is easy too. Level three to level four, how do you go from there? Engage all staff to develop cooperation commitments. So what I did was we created grassroots committees, enrichment committee, behavior committee, uh, breeding committee. So each one committee has the fundamental organization's the staff members, the core staff members involved. So that's how you involve. You don't tell your people what to do. You ask your people what we should do. So that's the fundamental key change in management, right? That's how you embrace management. You don't come from the top expecting them to do things for you, you are asking them to tell what you can do to make it better for them. So this is a very big, and that's where you get loyalty, you get respect, and you can be a very young dynamic leader, but a well-respected animal care person who is probably 50 or 60 years old, almost like me, will still be willing to 
listen to a 25 year old, 30 year old veterinarian simply because this person has given the ownership of creating better situations to those core staff members. So that's how you create a fundamental change in leadership style. So if you are youngsters thinking about becoming good leaders and managers, use that core uh, lesson. And motivation, we move from punishment, right? Before we said, if you don't perform, we are going to punish you. That's level one, that's very bad. Level two, we said, moving away from punishments to rewards. Now we are actually saying, from rewards to recognition. So you are actually going to get recognized for moving. And we have industry leaders sitting here who are probably recognized by many awards, several awards and rewards. And that's very good. But make sure if you are a manager, go back and reward your people who are telling you that I cared for this animal today and this is better than what we did last year. Acknowledge that, pat them in public, praise them in public, don't ever punish them if you have to do it in private, right? So that's exactly what you should do to go to level four. And how does level four? Now this looks like now walking in the water, walking on the water, right? It's level four. Let's see if we are, if anybody, if you think you are at level four, I want your autograph, okay? So really, and I really mean it, because we're very tough to achieve. Not even many facilities in USA can boast that they are at level four. To be frank, because they they have something, okay? Let, let's look at what, what might have gone wrong. You should have all of this to call yourself at level four. So majority of staff in the organization are convinced that animal welfare is important from a moral, scientific, and economic point of view. We did not hear the word legal business, right? We're talking about moral, scientific, and economic. Second one, the personal leadership towards animal welfare is seen at most levels. Everybody is a leader. Everybody in the staff members is telling, I created this enrichment. I changed the bedding two times in a day because I felt bad for the animal. So everybody is doing this, taking decisions on their own just to make sure the animal is healthy or clean or safe. So this is personal leadership. People spread on the behavior, values, and belief of animal welfare. They're talking about, if you go to the lunch parties, get to this. They're not talking about movies or cricket or soccer. They're talking about, I use this device and the animal feels better. I went and spoke to my animal. It kind of touched me with, the, with this paw. I kind of talked to my animal. It uh, kind of gestured me uh, in a very uh, loving manner. So these are the discussions around the food table. Not many people can boast of those kinds of discussions. That means they're taking their work very, very seriously. And it's very important. Rare or no animal welfare incidents. Very rare incidents. That facilities can tell that they never had any incident for several years. The organization has put significant proactive measures, continues to refine the system, process, and ALAC accreditation probably, uh, which is not mandatory to have, but if you volunteer to have one, that's a significant factor telling you that you don't have any mandatory findings, which means that you are really top notch. You're doing a good job. So now, there is level five, and that virtually is impossible. Uh, we should try to get there. If we, any one of you, raise your hand if you are, think that you have addressed all these things, and you have nothing to worry about in this thing. I am sure many of you have at least two or three things you are thinking, I really want to go back and address that thing. So that's where I am. I think develop consistency, fight complacency, and continue to improve the process. If you are here, if you want to move to level five, what is level five? What does it look like? I think it looks like uh, very beautiful. Because level five is the most beautiful thing that can happen to you if you are in lab animal science. And you should retire if you are at level five. Because there is no level six, right? So this is what it is. So now this is uh, <coughs> this is Manishi Chiller. This is as beautiful as her. So let's look at that. Continually improving level five. Animal welfare is a core company value, and concern for it is a critical side. So at the interview itself, you are asking people, "Do you care about animal welfare?" And they tell the answers that think that this is a critical side for the world. So but you are not hiring the wrong people anymore. That's very important, right? Many institutes make that mistake. Role model for best practices and three R's. And now this morning we emphasize on three R's. This is about three R's. So you become a role model. So people are approaching you and asking you, uh, can I have some information from you so that I can do that? So this is like, you are a role model now. Now you are at level four or level five when you, people ask you how to do things. And the third one, you are contributing to the society by organizing meetings. So I would say we are conducting conferences, meetings, and workshops to reach that. The organization has had sustained periods of years without a high potential animal welfare instance, but there is no feeling of compass. There's no incidents, but still people are acting like they're going to have an incident pretty soon. It's very proactive. And the last thing is the institute invests considerable effort in promoting animal welfare. 
They're not talking about Darren Institute, they're talking. So how do you look when you actually do all these things? The actualization process looks very clean. What should the leadership do to create this culture of death? So let's summarize it. So you first go back and assess your organization, find out which le what level you are in, create a culture of punishment, develop trust and cooperation, stay away from that, ensure direction, alignment, and commitment within teams, form sub-teams, sub-committees. It's not just you telling and knowing everything, it's all your people. Develop transparent, direct, fearless animal welfare reporting methods, whistleblower policy. Assure progress by creating methods of accountability and system. Encourage personal, professional development by trainings. Encourage scientists to work and value the contribution of animal care staff. I'm not saying veterinarian. I'm clearly telling animal care staff. Make sure your scientists interact with your animal care staff and let them tell the animal care staff how much they thank them for the research that they are doing. Because if the researcher goes to the animal care staff and says, I work for TNF, BDNF, and you're doing a great job, they're not going to get the point. The researcher has to be there, the veterinarian has to interface and tell. Because of you, your grandmother is going to be cured because of this disease, right? So that's how you connect with the people. So you'll be continuously doing that. Encourage links with outside world, with organizations. Publish. Publish the successes, practices for the benefit of lab animal care and for greater good of society. And try to celebrate these publications, these movements. And that's how you reach level five and go there. So if you are at level one or two, we are all there. If you are at level three, you are special. If you are level four, you are very, very special. And if you are level five, you are Miss India. Okay? So that's what uh, this is about. So try to find which level are you. This is culture of caring. It is about caring for animals and caring for people. We have several survey questions. I'm not going to run through this question. But to find out where your institute stands, you can ask these questions and find the answers. Just one question. A uh, couple of questions. I think this was created by Jayesh and uh, our staff members, Madhumitana. So animal welfare is clearly written, described, and accessible. Is it true or not? So make, this, make sure you answer these questions. Animal husbandry and experimental work is assigned with humane animal care in mind. Answer these questions. All your scientists should answer. Your staff should answer these questions. Let's look at a little bit more specifics here. My immediate supervisor is willing to listen and act on animal welfare concerns. So if a staff member comes and says, that's an incident, if you don't act on it, that means that you are not in level one or level two. You're probably level one. So look at those things. Uh, managers communicate clearly. That's important. Several questions. I'm not going to go through all of it. At our side, animal welfare is stopped. Resources necessary for staff. This is what your leadership know, should know. Uh, the equipment, time, staffing, training, enrichment, everything is available. And new employees are oriented. Animals are treated with respect and compassion. Uh, motivation. You can make frame questions depending on your geographic region and language and everything. And I want to thank a few people for this thing. I want to summarize as well. But I want to thank uh, definitely ALAC for giving me uh, knowledge to stand and talk in front of you, actually. And years of service at ALAC is next to nothing. It's beautiful and it's uh, enormously uh, invigorating and educational, right? So try to interact with ALAC. Uh, BMS, my company. Coffee, who just retired, my boss. But he was a very sincere supporter of NASA and several things that happened in India. So thanks to him, and he was part of this. And Mohan Pandey is the MBA mind behind this, and he was uh, my colleague at uh, BBRC. BBRC is our Sinjin BBRC facility in Bangalore. And this is how our facility looks, very clean, very caring scientists and caretakers. We try to learn new things and care for our animals. And we tend to reach out across the globe but needless to say, we have to keep our environment clean. And coming to Delhi and telling that doesn't need any more interaction, right? So we have to learn how to keep the environment clean while doing all these things. And then finally, we should be grateful to all those creatures, animals, who are equal to humans, who give their lives for the welfare of our kind. Very, very important message, right? So we need to treat them with respect and carry on. So the summary is employ the capability maturity model in your institute. Keep thinking about it. 
I will share this presentation with PJ and Lasa. And he can forward my presentation to you. And you can communicate with me. And I am very much available starting from January in India. And this is very important. So once you measure what kind of culture you have in your institute, you know where you stand and you know what to do next. So the whole point of this talk is about what we are going to do, who we are now, and what we want to be next. Thank you. Any questions or um, not, not necessary? And feel free to ask questions on sentinel breeding and everything because that's uh, that's my scientific expertise. So I can make mistakes. So excuse me if I'm wrong. Where we were and how we are going, and the future looks very nice. Maybe we are all prepared for it. Thanks for giving this talk. I'm sure it's a great uh, uh, stimulus to all of us to you know, use this as a point to take forward. Is, is it a good idea uh, putting it across? We have a CPC ACM manual that talks about some norms across, and we have at least a paragraph or a page on this culture of care. And come into that, it will be a good idea so that everybody reads it. Absolutely. I agree with you, Lok Shankar. I think this is something that the uh, Indian leadership here, who are actively involved, like Arvind and Ramchandra and Vijay and many of you, you are touching on my weakness, which is I am a core scientist and a veterinarian. I like to uh, talk also and improve the leadership. I'm sure new. Newcomers into this field, I would not say Balaji as a newcomer, but definitely he is a, he's from Harvard, and so he should be grasping these things just like that. So he, he probably, and you probably, and all of you here, probably are aware of CPCSC, right? That's a, that's a no-brainer. Now, incorporating CPCSC, integrating that into three hours was an attempt made several years ago and even today in the talk. It's very fair for you to talk to Gauri Shankar, for somebody to pick the phone and talk to Gauri and say, we heard this talk from Suresh, and he made some good points. We want to incorporate, and I have his card, and I can accompany you to that if you want some clarifications. But definitely, we should make it India relevant. I am giving this talk across the globe, so that's probably why I sound like that uh, with, with my global uh, journeys. But I think uh, for India, I think it's important to call CTCSC and involve them into this uh, whole thing. So I agree with you totally. So, uh, great talk, Suresh. Uh, it's always a pleasure to to listen to your talks. Uh, and then also I'd like to congratulate uh, the organizers for having such a great talk. Uh, uh, we cannot have a better talk than this to start this conference, uh, because it has set, set the stage for the rest of the day's discussion. So let's let's have a big round of applause one more time for Dr. Suresh. So uh, Suresh, my question is, like, uh, since uh, you have great uh, exposure, uh, both in Indian uh, environment, working in Indian company, as well as abroad, uh, would you like to share how easy or how difficult it was for you to follow this uh, culture of care at your organization? And, and uh, if you can just uh, share your experience in terms of how much time it took to whatever level your organization has reached, I think that would really enlighten us from that. Thank you. Good. So, uh, good question, Deepa. Thank you for acknowledging this thing. Uh, very important for you to recognize this is we tried to talk culture of care three years ago. But we were working towards it without our knowledge, like all of us. All of us work. All I tried to create is how to measure it. That's what we tried to create. When we actually tried to measure, we, I actually understood the difficulties that I went through. It's like analyzing, I don't want to say this because I will be politically incorrect, but I can probably dare to say it because my wife is not around. <laughs> not here. She's probably sleeping wherever she is. So I think for a successful marriage, you need to measure how successful the marriage is. <laughs> Otherwise, you'll be going through mental agonies, arguments, and you'll always be feeling like, when I got married, I loved her this much. <laughs> but 30 years later, maybe I love my children this much, not my wife so much. Right? So, so it's, did we measure it, measure something there? We did. Because we measured, we know who we love the most. And that's exactly what it is. The difficulty in the Indian company, coming back to that, it's very, very difficult. I would say that for two reasons. One is getting the right talent in India is very difficult, extremely difficult. It's changing. Things are changing. 
When I came here, I think things were already changing for the good. But there's no right equipment, no right animal, and no right people. So to, to have all of this put into place for me took four years. So it will take four years at least for you to step from one level to the next level. If you're at level one, it will take one year. But level two to level three is where I jumped, and it took me four years. And level three to level four, where BMS is in USA, because we are standalone BMS. Here we have a partnership, right? So there are challenges. But where we are at level three or level four in BMS USA, I can easily tell that it was not easy for BMS. It took 25 years, and still we are talking about how to prevent incidents. So it's a moving target, very difficult. If you want to emphasize on moving from one level to another, and if you want to do that, tell that you need the right people, right kind of animal, and awareness apart from equipment and everything. Your scientists must be completely buying into working with you on caring for animals. It's not just a veterinarian. It's more than veterinarian. A veterinarian knows it the best, but there are other people who should be doing it. So I think it's very difficult because, but we, we can be there in four years. If that's your question, in Indian conditions. But now we are in 2017, not 28, so it should be much more lesser than that, smaller than that. Now we have more trained people. It's Velasa A class and Patricia's here, so you know there are a lot of things happening. So we are going to have more trained people. And I personally think that BBRC and Shinjin and we, uh, we have, um, you know, with the investment in training people, we have spread out those people across. And I see Murli there uh, in Hyderabad. I see Sarvation somewhere. And I see Praveen with me back. And I see KB with GSK. Now, these people are the leaders. They have been leaders. They have always been leaders. But now they have this knowledge to go and make it very fast. It's like dynamic effect. It's a fusion. It's a fusion. And that's where we come into play as good leaders. I hope we can continue to do that. Thank you. Good morning, Suresh. Wonderful talk. I just want to add one just point here. And uh, this is a different way of uh, thinking about what you just uh, outlined here. And uh, Rick, my partner from Hidasco, he puts it in a sort of an equation. He says total quality management approach. Hardware plus software multiplied by humanware. OK, so you can buy all the hardware you want. You can put in all the software you want. It's an additive thing. And then it gets multiplied <coughs> by the humanware. So one wrong mistake at the humanware level brings the whole thing down. And I think your talk exactly goes in those lines because you are trying to bring in that equation to the other side and helping the culture. And I think this is very informative for me as well, where we can look at it from the other side too. So I think it's a wonderful perspective. And if you think about it from a management perspective, it's a TQM approach. That's what we call it as. So think about all three aspects of it. And this works very well in that. So thank you. Thank you. This, you brought it out very well. Thank Thanks. You. I, thank you. I, I do think that you know, we, as the scientists and veterinarians, forget the management principles and continue to like what, do what we like the most, which is to go to the bench, go to the animal, inject the animal, probably pick the animal, do some research, publish the data. So that's, uh, that's bread and butter for all of us and the scientists. But if you think about the management, then we can make a difference. That's where I am. In my phase of life, and that's where I want to be and I am. And I'm so glad to see uh, four women from Sri Lanka. Right? I mean, lab animal science is dominated by women in Sri Lanka. So. <laughs> So four women in Sri Lanka, from Sri Lanka are here listening to this talk, and they are wondering, how do we make Sri Lanka better? I think uh, everybody has a starting point, so don't feel disheartened, and we'll do it. We'll all do it for the entire globe. Thank you for listening to me. Appreciate it. <laughs>